And here we are. Hello, everyone. Sorry, we were having some technical difficulties, but we're here. So uh, welcome, everyone. I am Lee Bukowski. I am very happy to welcome you to the March episode of the Bookish Road Trip Roadshow. Uh, this week, this month, our topic is a great one. It's Home Field Advantage. We're going to be talking to a panel of authors who set their books in their hometowns. And just to add a little interest, th this month I'm actually going to be a panelist and your host, so we'll see how this goes. So before we get started, a couple programming notes. If you have not already done so, you're going to want to allow StreamYard access to your Facebook name. If you don't do that, you will come up as just Facebook user in the comments. And we'd love to know who's joining us. We'd love to know who's asking questions and making comments. And we encourage you to do that. If you've not done that, if you've not allowed StreamYard that access, then just simply, if you wouldn't mind, preface your comment or your question with your name. And that way, we'll know who you are and we can respond to you. OK, so without further ado, I am very excited to introduce to you our panel today. We have Barbara Davis. Barbara, after a successful career in the jewelry business, she left the corporate world, as I, I find a lot of authors do that, leave the corporate world, to pursue her passion for writing. She is the author of eight novels, and books nine and ten are already in the works. Her novels are best described as club fiction with a little bit of mystery, a little bit of history, a little bit of romance, um, and some magic sprinkled in. Uh, Barbara was born in New Jersey, but she's lived in West Palm, Tampa, Charleston, Raleigh, Dover, New Hampshire. But she's recently relocated, and she says it's for good this time, to Central Florida with her husband, Tom. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We also have Leslie Rasmussen. Resley, Leslie is the award-winning author of After Happily Ever After, She's also written sitcoms for Burt Reynolds, Roseanne Barr, Norm MacDonald, and others, and over 20 essays for the Huffington Post. And she's a member of the Writers Guild of America, as well as Women in Film. She's a speaker, often on panels uh, discussing empowering women in midlife. And her next novel, The Stories We Cannot Tell, uh, will be published this year. And I'm honored to have you, Leslie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Valerie Taylor, Valerie writes romantic comedies. Her trilogy, What's Not Said, What's Not True, and What's Not Lost, has won awards both for contemporary fiction and series. She's also a published book reviewer. Valerie, you're one of those people we fear. You're a book reviewer. <laughs> As you should. I, Valerie enjoys practicing Tai Chi. And did I say that right? Is it Tai Chi? Is that how it's announced, mm -hmm. pronounced? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's an expert sports spectator. So you can see she's got her Red Sox yeah, I've jersey. I've got my, my Red Sox jersey. Yeah. And she's got a cozy mystery series in the works. So, and Valerie's, the, the final book in her trilogy just came out. We'll, we're we're going to be talking about that. And we have Suzanne Simonetti. She's a USA Today bestselling author. She grew up in the New York suburbs. Uh, she has a degree in marketing. She lives on Cape May Harbor, where I was fortunate enough to be able to visit her in the fall, which was great, great fun. Uh, with her husband. She loves yoga, paddle boarding, seafood, and her latest book, which is a novella uh, set in the heart of Cape May, will be uh, released on October 10th. So we're looking forward yeah. to that. So thank you, all of you. Oh, I, ha I guess I have to introduce myself, right, since I'm also mm -hmm. a panelist. So mm -hmm. as I said, I'm Lee Bukowski. Um, I am the author of a deb my debut novel, A Week of Warm Weather, just launched in June. It's a women's fiction novel. Um, I also teach writing at the college level. Um, when I'm not teaching or reading, I love traveling. Um, especially, I love visiting my two daughters, one who's in Boston and one who's in Fort Lauderdale. And I'm also, as some of you may know, a Billy Joel super fan with a live concert count of 45. Wow. And rumors of that restraining order he has against <laughs> me are greatly exaggerated. So don't believe it. <laughs> Uh, I'm also, I also finally just started uh, working on my second novel. So stay tuned for more on that. So awesome, ladies. Thank you so much. And we've got a lot of people joining us, which is very exciting. Thank you to those of you for uh, hanging in there with the technical difficulties. We know technology is great when it works, right? So let's get started. The first question I'm sure that uh, everybody wants to know is why? Why did you set your book in your 
hometown. So Barbara, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, I've actually written multiple books that are in, not in my hometown, because that's New Jersey, but um, it like the um, Keeper of Happy Endings, the contemporary story is set in Boston, and in the book that releases in four days, um, that also that's set in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So both of them are surrounding towns and historic towns that I love. And since there's like a real element of historic mystery to both of those books, mm -hmm. I felt like what better place to find a great setting? Uh, both the the buildings play a big role in both of those books. And there's no better architectural place than old New England to find that kind of building. So it just was, it was the perfect setup. It was also a place where I felt like someone from that was coming, escaping World War II in Paris could easily have ended up, you know, New York or Boston. So Boston just worked really well for me. Yeah, I agree. Boston's, I mean, Boston has a little bit of everything. And, and my daughter actually lives there. So as I was reading your book, Keeper of Happy Endings, I was like, oh, I know this place. I know that place. So we'll get, we'll talk about that, um, you know, even though some places might be fictionalized in these settings. But you're right. I think Boston just lends itself well to all the things you talked about. Suzanne, how about you? Kate May. Kate May. So well, we actually bought in Cape May in 2015. And I, I want to give a little bit of background on Cape May for those who may not be familiar with the town. It is, um, it's set at the very tippy end of New Jersey, where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Delaware Bay. Uh, in 1976, it was preserved as a historic district. So I loved hearing Barbara mention history because mm -hmm. I, there's so much, the town is wrought with history. Um, you know, it's, it's the kind of place where you have these uh, refurbished Victorian home sitting within two blocks mm -hmm. of the beach um, mm -hmm. and the horse and buggy riding by giving tours. So as a visitor, I was just completely inspired and brought in and um, to the town itself. And I got to meet a lot of people, very, very talented people from all walks of life, not just writers, but there are artists and singers and dancers and um, potters. And so there was a lot to pull from. So it was kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's so true. Kate May, it is it, it really is a very artsy town and I mean that in the the best possible way. Um but it is really a very enchanting town and it's a great and word. Great word really. for for a book setting. Great. Okay, Valerie. Well, my home state really is Connecticut. I was born and raised in Stamford, Connecticut and then moved around after I was married, but I set my trilogy, the home base, as Boston. And really, there's two reasons for that. It's kind of like, you know, have you ever gone somewhere and looked around and said to yourself, I've lived here before? And that, that's how I felt when I moved mm -hmm. there after my divorce in 2002. And then secondly, like Cassie, who's the central figure in my stories, I'm kind of psychic and a bit clairvoyant. And when I wrote What's Not Said in 2018, I had this sense that five years later, I'd be on a panel with an author who set her book in Connecticut. <laughs> so I didn't want to compete with Leslie. You are clairvoyant and I, I don't blame you. Nobody would want to compete with Leslie. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, Leslie. Yeah, that's right. It's funny because Valerie actually has set her book, one of her books in your hometown. Okay, so Leslie, you your first book, which your fabulous book after Happily Ever After is actually not set in your hometown, but your upcoming book, The Stories We Cannot Tell is. Right. So my first book, um, one of the things I wanted was Seasons. And I have been to Connecticut more times than I could possibly tell you. I've been married for a million years. My husband's from Connecticut. We were there three and four times a year and we always stayed in Shelton. So I felt like very home there. We have family there. I knew Connecticut, at least a lot of it and especially Shelton really well. So I decided to set my first book there. My second book, I started to think I'm from LA, born and raised. My second book is all LA because I wanted to do it in a place that I knew everything about, or pretty much everything about. And I just started a third book and that will also be Los Angeles. Oh, awesome. After writing about Connecticut, even though I loved all the seasons, I just felt like I wanted to write about my hometown now. Yeah, I can understand that. And that, that's actually, so for me, my book is set in my hometown, 
um, of Reading, Pennsylvania. And, you know, it, some people have heard of it, some people haven't. So, you know, we're about 50 miles west of Philadelphia. Um, and so I really, as a debut author, I really wanted to write about a place that I knew authentically. Um, and also we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, you know, tying in my main character, Tessa's life. Um, I really felt that I could, I could, because there were some threads of uh, truth for my own life, I really felt it would be more authentic to set it in, in my hometown. Um, my, my town, unlike the ones you're talking about, is not well known. Um, but it definitely has its nuances. It definitely, it's it's really, it's kind of a hub. A lot of people who really don't want to live in the city, you know, will we'll move out from Philadelphia and the Philadelphia suburbs to places like Berks County, where my book is set. Um, but I, I really felt like it had, you know, it just had that right amount of that hometown flair um, that, that people could maybe, could, could relate to. Uh, so I think that's really interesting that, you know, some of us, the, the small towns, uh, and, and the big cities, every, they all have something that lends itself to the stories that we're, we're trying to tell. Uh, Michelle's commenting, uh, Suzanne, on um, how her Kate May was her stomping grounds, and she talks about the Christmas parade, and that's one of the things um, that I know about Kate May. Um, so yeah, and, and the zoo, I have to say, the Kate May Zoo is, is uh, you know, pretty well known. Yep. Um, yep. So, you know, so just kind of going off of that question, what then, and it's interesting, because even though we've lived in these places and it's, you know, why we choose to, to set our books there, um, what what research uh, needed to be done? For, for me, I actually did, you know, get in my car and drive around to places um, just to just to really remember, you know, the landscape and, and just, you know, be able to authentically, again, you know, describe, you know, the streets and the buildings and uh, the culture and the things that are going on. So did any of you feel, even though you've lived in these places where your books are set, uh, did you feel as though you needed to do, and if so, what kind of um, research? Leslie, what do you think about that? Well, with Shelton, since I'd been there so many times, I did go around in there, but I also researched it online. Mm -hmm. And I also made up a couple of things that I knew, like a Starbucks, you know, that kind of thing that mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was in exactly the right place. So I did a little bit of fictionalizing, but not a lot. For Los Angeles, I wanted to, for my second book, I wanted to bring in a lot of places I've been to that I really enjoyed. And restaurants and the Beverly Hills Hotel and places that people would recognize, even if they weren't from Los Angeles. So I did do some research just because sometimes, you know, you've been there like a million times and you want to get exactly what the room looks like. So I did go on and Google like the inside of certain restaurants that I've been to a million times. But when you're writing, you don't always remember it at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a lot of looking at pictures and images and things like that, too. Yeah, and it's crazy. You can do the, the whole Google Google Maps thing. You can just put yourself in a town and it's like you're walking down. It's like simultaneously really cool and also terrifying, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat tool, you know, that you don't have to actually, if it's someplace in another state or whatever, actually go there. Uh, Valerie, how about you? Did you do research or just kind of go with what you know? So two things that... Um, I recall in this regard. One is that um, in What's Not Said, which is the debut novel, uh, there's a lot set in, in a hospital. And I, at first I was going to uh, really call it uh, Mass General. And then mm. I had been to Mass General certainly when I lived up there, but I, I realized that it could have changed over the years and if I started referring to, if I called it Mass General and I got a detail wrong, then I would be crucified yes. by readers. So I fictionalized the hospital and um, that seemed to work because you can get all kinds of um, pictures and stuff online about, um, you know, what it's like in a hospital environment. The other thing that was really funny was that when I was having... Um, what's not said, uh, kind of read, you know, not proofread, but kind of beta, a beta reader. Mm -hmm. um, she noticed that uh, one of the, the main streets um, in, in Boston, I had going the wrong direction. And so, huh. so she says, no, you, you know, whether it was 
Boylston or one of the other streets. She says, no, you don't go that way. You go the other way. And so, know. you know, so that's, that was good. <laughs> it, it is really amazing that the beta readers are just, they're just a godsend because we can't pick up all those things. And that reader saved you from that very unhappy right. 2 a.m. reviewer who just wants to write, you know, they're few and far between, but they're out there. So that, that person saved you from that. that that's awesome. Right. Um, so Suzanne, and I actually, that, you guys are, you're so good. You're actually incorporating my next question into this one. So, uh, and the question was going to be, did you, with, with the research that you did, did you also fictionalize some of the places and streets and businesses and so forth? Or did you stay true? You know, did you stick to exactly, uh, you know, the, the exact name? So Suzanne, what did you do? Okay. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the research part. That was the best part for me because I was, I had made, Kate made my hometown. Was it my hometown? So I had a lot of learning to do. And I got very serious about it. I hit the streets with a notepad and a pen and a cat and a, my phone and picture. I was taking pictures. My husband trailed along. I was talking to people. I'm friends with some of the guys who were the public works department who were like trim the trees and keep the town beautiful. I've known them for 10 years already. It, I started this 2013, the research. So it was wonderful. Um, as far as the real versus the fiction, mm -hmm. most of it is most of it is real, like like the lobster house. When I talk about things like that, or the Cape May Sentinel, the famous lighthouse at the at the state park, um, there are things that I, I had to be true to the story. But the, for the novel I'm writing now, I should say that the Christmas novella that I, will be set, Michelle, in Cape May, um, it's going to be all about the Christmas parade. There were a couple of things like the Victorian home I'm writing about with this particular family is fictionalized. I, I, you know, I learned about, I have a friend who owns a Victorian, so I got a little information from her, but I did not base it on a real house. And the characters, of course, are all made up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you, we always get that like, uh, oh, is this this? And is it, you know, well, and, and, and especially the, oh, I think this person is me. And no, it's not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. That's that's what you have to do. But that's awesome that you really poured yourself into yeah. that research. Because like you said, you made Kate May your hometown, which is great I'm because sure. you're not from there. So no. that's awesome. So, yeah. Barbara, how about you? So did you um, how did did you research? I know your book. Well, your book actually. The, the one that I had just, the one I just finished, The Keeper of Happy Endings, takes place in two different, you know, in two different countries. But when you w were writing about Boston, did you research and did you fictionalize uh, names of streets and places or did you stay true to the real ones? Well, mine is um, most of the, the Boston that is in Keeper of Happy Endings is historic Boston. It right. was uh, post-World War II through 1984. So there are a lot of the things that are there now aren't, you know, weren't, weren't existent when, when the novel was set. And then vice versa, a lot of the things that, that I used in the novel are gone now. So I had to, I had to do kind of a different kind of research. It was a little bit more involved. Um, but, Thank God for Google and the pictures and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, anyway, thank God for the online and the pictures. Uh, there was a whole, whole, um, there's one character and I don't want to give any spoilers. There's one character who has a different sort of lifestyle from the average person in the book. And there's a, a whole kind of strip of places that these people go. And so I wanted to make that very authentic because it's to me, for me, it's a very, it's, it touched on a very serious subject and I wanted to make sure I got it right. So I did a lot of research on that particular demographic at that mm -hmm. time, which was really quite, quite interesting and fun, but the actual building where Celine sets up her bridal salon is an actual building that I love in Boston and it's caught my eye for since we first moved up there and I thought that's gonna have to I have to use that building and it's right by DeLuca's market it's right you know it's a, if you saw a picture of the building you would like and have been to Boston you would like I know where that is so I loved describing all of the 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 details the architectural details of this place but inside was obviously completely fictionalized because that bridal shop didn't really exist there 
you know, and it, it, honestly, it's vacant. I think it's still vacant now. So it was just like the perfect setting, but there was a lot of historical research that had to go in, like where they ate and where they danced, those places aren't there now, but I wanted to use real places. So I had to dig, dig for those and get pictures of what those places would have looked like, like in the late forties and early fifties, but it was yeah. it's so much fun. That's so cool. I was going to ask you about that, the building that Celine, and it, I, I just love how it kind of speaks to her. It does speak to her. Well, it spoke uh, to me, was, so. <laughs> right, right. So I was going to ask you that if, that, if that's an actual building, and you did such a great job. As many times as I've been to Boston, I know exactly the street you're talking about, but I, I re you did such a great job of describing it, and, and you're right. Some things like that, and all of you kind of touched on that, there are some things that you really just have to leave true to their true to themselves right. in um, boston you, you do not want to get boston wrong because if once boston is in your heart it's there and if you get it wrong someone is going to call you on it so i researched all the streets i hope i didn't have anybody turning the wrong way on one one way street <laughs> i did not research that um but all of the streets are real um and i tried to use like in the 84 like what apartment buildings would have been there mm -hmm. and stuff I love that. And you're right, Boston. It's you, if you've seen them drive, you know, they're going to they're going to call you out. They're going to call you out if you. Uh, but I think you, you, it wrong. you I think you got it right. But so I I did, as I said, I kind of drove around and I I I changed some of the names of businesses and so forth. Um, but in particular, there was a business that I reference when my protagonist goes back to visit her childhood home. And I actually went to there's a business that's still there. Um, and, and it was years and years and years ago, it was run by a man and his granddaughter now runs it. It's like a luncheonette. It's like an old fashioned, um, you know, one of those like a soda shop kind of place. Um, it, you can you can think about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I do lie about my age, but I'm old enough to remember things like that. And so I, I went there and I, you know, I kind of looked around and I didn't talk to her at first, but eventually I went to her and I said, hey, you know, I just wanted you to know I'm writing this book. It's coming out next summer. And I included your, you know, I included your business in the book. Um, and she just was thrilled by that, um, you know, and, and she just couldn't get over how, you know, how cool that was. So, um, again, it was I feel like it's kind of a historic sort of place, even though, again, mine's more of a small town. But it's just that feeling that there are some things you just really want to portray. You don't you just don't want to change them. And you want to get it right. And you, you really want to, you know, get the heart of that. So um, I can appreciate all of, I can appreciate exactly what you're talking about there. Um, so those of you who've lived in more than one place, um, and I think all of you have other than me, I'm actually now, uh, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. I do not live in Connecticut. That's right. So, and I was born and raised here, but I, you know, I went to college and things like that. And I moved, you know, toward Philly for a while, um, you know, during my first marriage and that sort of thing. Um, but if you, so Valerie and, and Suzanne mm -hmm. and Barbara, this is probably more for you, although Leslie, feel free to chime in. What made you pick, and maybe you've already an, kind of answered this, what made you pick one place over another? You know, cause that's kind of hard if you've lived in, if you've lived in more than one place and you want to set a book in one of your hometowns, you know, how did you, how did you go about choosing? So Suzanne, you, you said you made Kate May your home. So we did. Yeah, and I grew up in the Hudson Valley. I'm originally from Hudson Valley, New York. I'm a Yankees fan, by the way, but we're going to keep peace on the call. Oh, <laughs> no, we and I'm a Dodgers fan, so you know. <laughs> so, but can and I, I, will, I won't remind any of you that your teams were not in the World Series last year. I know, I know the Phillies were, but anyway, that doesn't matter. Go ahead. No, no insult to my hometown, which is lovely. It's it's right near Nyack, New York. That's more of the famous place that people know in the area. Just oh, okay. it's just on the other side. It's I'm about 40, it's 40, 40 minutes outside of Manhattan. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, he made was a, as a resort destination and so many people have mm -hmm. been there and the, where I was from is not, it's not. And I just, it was just such a difference. There, there, it's apples to oranges. I wouldn't even have dreamed of setting a, a book where I grew up. And, yeah. and when you, when you read, when all of you read the sound of wings and you should, you'll see it is just the perfect setting. Um, it just has that right amount of all, as I said, it's very enchanted. It just has that, it just has that feeling that really you're, it, it, you know, I think sometimes 
the setting almost is like a character, you know, in a book. 100%. Yeah. I've always said that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's definitely true. Yeah. Um, and Valerie, so you kind of, you touched a little bit on um, why Boston versus Connecticut. Well, but I, I would like to point out that um, there are side trips in each of my books. And mm -hmm. what's not said, there is a very important uh, scene in Venice. Uh, and then in What's Not True, um, Cassie goes to Paris and then in What's Not Lost, it's Paris and Greece. And um, I did go to each of those locations in my life. And so I did have experience with that. And in, um, in What's Not Lost, um, I actually kind of saved my favorite to last, like the very last is set at a winery in Catacalon, Greece. And um, I actually went to Mercury Estates when I was on a, a cruise. It was an excursion off the cruise. And I was, I just loved the winery. And so I had, it inspired me. So I had to make it the, the very last scene in the trilogy. And um, when I was writing the scene, I actually contacted uh, the owner of the winery there because I had some questions about it and uh, they were very excited and, and gracious and, and answered my questions. And I've, I've sent them two books, um, in, not through book depository, but through the mail uh, like five weeks ago and they still haven't arrived. They're sitting in Athens. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But um, yeah, I, I liked having Boston as kind of the, the foundation, but that there are these side trips that kind of, uh, I think, add some color to, to the whole stories. Yeah, they definitely do. And you're, and that, the last scene in, in uh, What's Not Lost, I, I, that wine, just that setting in Greece was so beautiful, but that's so exciting that you actually did uh, get to go there. If you, if you, you know, I, I'm so generous. If you want me to go to Athens, pick up the books. <laughs> take them there for you to the winery you can do you know, that I, on, I, your, I could, on your dime i could probably fine. free up some time no well you should send me i mean you know that's, that's <laughs> only right barbara i think you you probably already it could, feel free to say i've already answered that question but do you have anything to add um not not really uh like valerie i had one book that was set on a winery it was in North Carolina, outside of Raleigh, where people don't realize there's a lot of new wineries springing up. And it was when that was my hometown when I wrote that book. So again, it was a hometown thing. And there's, I think, I think stories for me, the way they come to me, they sort of come fully formed and the setting is sort of built in. Mm -hmm. And I just never, I mean, I was, I'm a fair lawn, New Jersey girl. And no story that's ever landed on me has said, set this in fair. <laughs> it's just, it's not, um, it's a very small, you know, it was suburby. It, it's not, it, there's nothing, it's a wonderful place to grow up, but it's, it's not, uh, I wouldn't call it picturesque. It doesn't have that feel like a Cape May and certainly not like a Boston or even like old Raleigh. So I think, I think a lot of our stories, maybe I'm speaking at a turn, but my stories sort of come with a built-in place where they belong. And I look for that. I so, love that. So, that so I would say resonate. I would say I would say that I live in Shelton, Connecticut, where Leslie's book is yeah. uh set. And when I started reading it, I was like, why would anybody write a book set in Shelton, Connecticut? <laughs> well, Connecticut, though, the Amazing. East Coast has so much besides the, you know, seasons. It's just there's an atmosphere. And I think I completely agree with what Barbara just said, because my first book felt like this protagonist would live in Connecticut when I created her. She just felt like that's where she was from. My second book had to be L.A. It was just what this, the story was and who these people were. I just felt like they had to be in Los Angeles. So sometimes when you form characters, you realize that the setting is, they're telling you where they should be set. It's, like, a, yeah, it's an organic choice. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. And I think that's what we were talking about. And some of the people who are joining us are agreeing with the sort of the setting as a character. 
But Barbara, you're so right. And and my my book, which is set, it's in a, it's in a town where you might read it and be like, well, why would anyone live there? That's it's nondescript. Um, it's not, you know. But but it for me, it, it was important to me for my first book to you know to just to have it you know in a place where I grew up, so I could really write about it authentically and not have to worry so much about you know kind of getting it wrong. Um, but I totally agree with you. I think it, when I'm thinking about all of your books and and your different themes and topics, and you, it's it's true. It, the setting it kind of comes to you. It comes to you really just as part of the story. And when you say, "Well, this character just seems like she would live here," that that's so true. And I think that's that's something that, you know, once you get past that, I think it's I think it would be really difficult um, to to write a book and then feel like the character is just kind of out of place and isn't where he or she mm -hmm. belongs. So um, I, I think that's so true. Um, uh, Barbara Conry is joining us. She's saying that she wants to set her next book in a winery. <laughs> Valerie, you've inspired her. And Barbara, I will go with you to do your research. Um, <laughs> Oh, the research for that one was fun. Do you see how magnanimous I am that I just will offer to, to yeah, you, all of you yeah. lovely ladies with your endeavors? Um, so this next question, do you think that it would be easier in some ways, even though we, you know, you all have these wonderful reasons for writing, setting your books where they are in these actual towns? Do you think sometimes, does it ever cross your mind that you say, you know, it would just be easier to make this up so no one's checking on it. No one's going through it to say, wait a minute, that street runs this way and not that way. So what do you think about that? Do you find, do you, does that ever, does that thought ever creep into your mind? Like, you know what, it might just be easier to make up a city or town. Valerie, what do you say? So I am doing that with uh, the Cozy Mystery series that I've started working on. I've, um, I've created a fictional town located between uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and the Cape, and it's a it's a fictional uh, whaling town, and so there is one there called uh, a real town called New Bedford, and I've started um, attending some of uh, some webinars that they have about the history of New Bedford, and that's been really informative because not only uh, is it giving me a feel for what uh, the town should be? Because it's contemporary, not historical, that I'm writing about. But it's also providing me with um, expanded uh, plot lines that I hadn't thought about before. So when you do yeah. the research, um, you know, you're not always going down a rabbit hole. You know, often it can give you, um, you know, really color commentary, if you will on how to expand and, and uh, really, uh, you know, for, formulate your story more robustly. That's, that's, such, that's so great. How did you learn about webinars on, how did you learn about that there were webinars? Well, on the there's, there's a museum there. Uh -huh. uh, and so I, I just started poking around because I've been to the museum and I will certainly go back up there. Um, but then I saw these different programs, which they apparently started, you know, during the pandemic, but now they're still continuing them and they're online. And so I can just, you know, I can just attend them. That's they're probably really cool. wondering, they're probably wondering why is this woman from Connecticut on all of our meetings? You know, <laughs> you know people, people, I'm a spy. <laughs> once you, once people find out that you're writing about their town, they are so, they love to tell you everything. And they, yeah. th stories about people who are no longer alive and businesses are, that are no longer there and how they came and why they went away. And like those little things can just set, like, like Valerie said, they set off a light bulb and they send you somewhere and think, you know, that wraps right into what I'm doing. And it just kind of adds this layer of authenticity mm -hmm. and you don't have to like write a paragraph on it, but just dropping that in. And then yeah. the people of the town just love that you care about those little things because they're important to them. And, you know, we just write about the big buildings or whatever. Mm -hmm. You start getting mm -hmm. into that more granular stuff, just dropping little bits here. They love it. And they'll tell you anything you ask them. That is good. Yeah, I'm planning. Go ahead. I was just going to say that going back to Lee's question, 
one of the things, like when I wrote about Los Angeles for my second book, I had been to all these places. I knew what it was like, but readers can be very, very picky about certain things. I mean, even my editor from the publishing house for the second book, she was questioning me on things. And I said, and she doesn't live in a Los Angeles or even in California. And I had to say, no, you know, I go to this place. She said, only tourists would go there. I said, that's not true. Everybody who lives in Los Angeles goes everywhere. It's not just tourists. So it's like you get all of these things from people. That's why sometimes it is easier to fictionalize like stores. I think I fictionalized some stores in Shelton and things like that and changed business names because then you don't get the people going, that doesn't exist or that's, you know, because they don't know. That's right. that, that's fascinating that it's funny because of uh, obviously we think LA is a, a tourist town but people live there <laughs> yeah. no, everything there's lots of culture I go to museums all the time I go to you know this was a, happened to be a bowling alley in Hollywood that I set a scene in and the, my editor was like no person who lives in Los Angeles would go there I said I've been there what and there were people about? there <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. That is People amazing. Do bowl. Yeah. I, I run into a couple of things where I have to check the details. Like this happened to me yesterday. I'm wrapping up the end of this book and um, I have it, a scene where, where it takes place on Christmas Eve in 1983 in the library. And I said, well, I need to know when this library was built. And oddly enough, you can basically find anything on Kate May, but I could not. I was on their Facebook pages wow. and I was everywhere. I just picked up the phone and called the library yesterday. And lo and behold, she, they, the library was built in 1982. So I just made it. So I'll be able to include that. But that was, a, I was trying to explain to my husband. I'm like, this is a big deal. I had to get that right because yes. I would have had to change it. You know, yes. <laughs> at least the time I would have had to change. Fun, yes. yes. Make it, finding finding when things open and close and were built and then, or, or were pulled down is a big thing because people will absolutely point, point it out and say that was knocked down in 82 and you're saying they went there in 84 and they, there are just some readers who live to pick that detail apart and call you out. I don't know why, but, but, they, but they will find you. So I also, the, the, um, like the last of the moon girl, it was about a town that had some, um, made some not nice judgments about a, a family that was living there. Um, and the whole town was, it was a sort of a small minded town. And I didn't want to dump that, that stigma on a, on an actual town. So I wow. completely made up that one was set in, um, uh, it's called Salem Creek. But it was it, it was more like a Dover, New Hampshire. But I didn't I didn't want to dump that on Dover, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, which is a wonderful, welcoming place. Mm -hmm. So I created a place where nobody would, so no one would feel offended. Like I was, you know, slapping them with the label. Right. So there's yeah. there's always that too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I did, that's that's a great point. I I'm thinking so for my second book, um, I think I'm going to do what kind of what you're talking about, Valerie. So I'm going to create a fictional town, but kind of based on, or, you know, loosely based on the town. My sister lives in Skipack, which is kind of a suburb of Philadelphia. Um, but it's one of those really cool towns. It's got history. It's got culture. It has a great walking, you know, shopping, dining area. It's got old buildings and new buildings, and there are very affluent sections and not so much. And so to hear Barbara, I'm, I'm, I was thinking that because there's such this in, you know, spring is coming and people are out again, I was thinking it would be kind of neat to go downtown and, you know, talk to people, talk to business owners, talk to people who've lived there for forever, for their whole lives. Maybe talk to people who are new, you know, why did they come there? So um, I'm glad to hear. I, I think you're right. I think when people do learn that you're writing about, you know, their, their place that they do get excited about that. And they mm -hmm. feel this sense of pride and they want to share with you and share stories. And like you said, it's not like you have to include them as the stories they're telling you, but you know, all this, and then you can kind of drop it in, you know, where appropriate. So, um, so I love that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Um, so this is a question that um, is near and dear to me. Um, I, I'm wondering if you've had feedback from readers uh, who live in the places where you've set your books. I know I mm -hmm. have. I was so surprised and so happy. I had many, many readers from my general area reach out to me to say that they loved being able to 
you know, visualize the, the streets that I was, you know, as I'm, you know, navigating around the town and the businesses, even if I changed some of the names, they actually, they just loved being able to recognize those places in, in, in their, you know, because it's their hometown as well. Um, and so I, I was, I mean, I just love obviously hearing anything from readers, but that was one of the things that I really enjoyed uh, that people were telling me that they really loved, like, oh, I know that place. I know that street. I've been to that. Uh, and I referenced the business. I actually went uh, there when, after the book um, came out. And it was very ironic. I walked in. I wanted to give the owner of this, this you know, soda shop type place. It's now more of like a breakfast. Actually, I think she's open all day. But it's it's really like an old school soda shop kind of place. And I went there to give her a, a signed copy of the book. And when I walked in the door, so I took my dad with me because he, of course, knows the owner from way back when or knew him that he's now deceased. We go in and she's there at the counter and, and she's with another woman and they've got their heads bent over something that I can't see. And they turn around and they're like, oh, my gosh. So the person at the counter, the customer was there showing the owner where in the book <laughs> I mentioned her business. And while she's doing that, I show up with my signed copy. I couldn't I have love it. any better. So it was wow. really kind of like, oh, my gosh, I was the, here's the author. So and it was so it, it just made me I was so I was just so pleased by that and humbled by that of how excited she was. So how, how about uh, how about you? Have you heard from people who live? You know, what do you get from readers who live there? Uh, what kind of feedback do you get? Leslie, do you want to start? Well, I have tons of family in Connecticut, all over Connecticut. So they were all so excited to read the book and, you know, know Shelton. And I talked about Stanford and lots of different places in Connecticut. Um, the second book hasn't come out yet, but my beta readers were thrilled that it was, you know, because they were in Los Angeles. They were, you know, different people that I know that um, are writers and stuff. And they were thrilled that they could imagine or have been to all these places. So I think it makes a huge difference to readers when they're from those places or from some place they visited, if they've gone to Connecticut or come to Los Angeles, you know, been to the beach in Los Angeles, any of those things, they love reading about that stuff. And businesses around me, like my bookstores and stuff get so excited when you write about the local area. Yes, yeah, it's just, there's just something about it. Valerie, how about you? Well, the reactions that I get about settings for my three books are mainly about how I describe Paris and Greece. I mean, people um, consistently give me kudos for how I've described the settings in those uh, places, which surprised me because I don't feel writing settings is my strength. I mean, uh, I get a lot, I get the most comments about uh, my dialogue, that it's the chef's kiss, that it's perfect, that it's realistic and everything. So I really uh, am very humbled and gratified when people say, oh, you know, I just, I just love the way that you describe Paris. It's so beautiful. And, I, you know, I just want to go to Greece because mm -hmm. of the way that you described it. So, yeah. I mean, that's all. I have to say about that. that. No, that's interesting. And it's interesting that you that you don't feel like you do a, a not, not that you don't feel like you do a good job, but that's not your strength. But I think you do such a great job uh, with describing setting. But your dialogue is, listen, out there, I know Valerie looks like she's very sweet and innocent and she is lovely, but she's <laughs> got just the right amount of sass in mm. her writing. Don't let her fool you. You might look a little. So great. Yeah. Suzanne? I wasn't going to go there. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll go there. You it's don't accurate to. what you just said about Valerie, and it's so true. I love that. Um, in KMA, it's kind of interesting because there is this clear distinction between the locals and then the natives. Um, the no. There's a lot of pride in Cape May and a lot of people have been there and they have roots that go way back. So they want to make sure that the locals don't get themselves confused with the natives. Um, so the book club that I had, uh, my neighbor, Kathy Brown pulled together for us. We met at Lucky Bones. I heard all positive things, but these women, they've been living there for many, many years, but they're transplants like me, you know, so, so it's not like they grew up in Cape May. So they're um, the locals. They're, they're the locals. we're locals. We're locals, okay. but not natives. Not the natives. Okay. Right. Now I have heard from a couple natives. I saw a couple reviews out there, uh, from a woman who said she was there for 30 years and I got all positive marks. That was like. 
okay, you know, let's go have lunch somewhere because that's something to celebrate, you know. <laughs> um, so it's just interesting because it's a very small town and there's a lot of pride. And so I think mm. at first they're like, who is this person? And she's writing about our town and there's a curiosity of, is she going to get it right? You know? Yeah, yeah, people are very, they're very protective of their towns, you find. And, um, and, and again, I think that that's where we really, really just feel like we have to get it. We want to get it right. Um, so Barbara, do you hear from readers uh, who, I'm sure you hear from readers from everywhere. Do you I, I think one of them, especially right after I launch a new book, there's always like a, a mass of people that, that jump in and they love that I've included their favorite restaurant or their mother used to live on such and such a street. But then I also get like, I will use a local business but I won't call it what it is. I'll name, I'll rename it something else, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you where it is. And it's in another town, like one town over. And people will say, you can tell me the truth. Was that actually based on X, Y, Z? And I'm like, okay, here's the truth. Yes, it was. <laughs> it, it's remarkable that people, and it's, it's just, I take pride in the fact that in their minds, I called it this, but when they walked yes. in, while they were reading, they were in that place they knew and they yes. knew, or they said that house is that house. It's a blue house and it's on Dover Point Road. I'm like, that's the house. That's where, wow. where it was. So I, I love getting those, making those, because it's like you you landed the plane for the people exactly. that know the area. You like, let's go have lunch. Let's see if they said. Exactly. You landed the plane. So whoo. Yeah, right. you can you can call it whatever you want, but those readers recognize exactly you know where you're talking about what that business is or that street. That's 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 interesting. I got one just I got one just yesterday. So really, that's great. Oh, excellent. So what do you think about? Do you think? And I know that you know we talked about all of the resources out there. You know the Google, like the Google Maps one is just really one that kind of blows my mind. But so. Do you think that it's possible? I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, do you think it's possible for somebody to write about, put a book in, in a setting that they've never been, that they've never ever lived in or even visited? What do you think about that? Suzanne, what do you think? Interesting. I, I would have to know this. I feel like I would have to know the story and how yeah. how how the setting would tie into the plot. Is yeah. that makes sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Because I think, and it touches on what all of you were saying. I think Barbara brought it up. Was that that you know it comes to you, you know it sort of comes to you as a package. So it's kind of hard, I think, to just think, you know, that far outside the box to say, all right, I'm just going to pick some town I've never been. Would I set a book there? Well, like you said, I think it kind of depends, you know, what what is the book about or, you know, who are the characters? So I think, I think it would be better to fictionalize it if you're going to do that. If, do that. Then you're going to get a lot of readers if you never go. And even if you do research on it, it's not the same if you've never been there. So I think it would be hard. But yeah, you're going to get you're going to get it wrong. Barbara. Barbara? Never been to Paris. Mm. Wow. Paris, never been. I, we were never scheduled been. to go to do the research trip and, you know, do the walk and talk. And then COVID hit. So I had to do all of my research there it is. online. So I did like a lot of the walking tours. But a caveat, I was researching Paris in the 19, from 1939 wow. to 1940. Okay. Right. I think you can do that. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a different, a different thing because a, a although not everything, a, a lot was fictionalized, but I went out of my way, like again, even like I did with Boston to use uh, places that were actually existent at the time. Right. Um, so I, I think it can be done, but if you're going to do it, you better really commit to digging deep because otherwise you will. And I have not had a single person call. They wanted to know how much time I spent in Paris. Wow. Everyone assumes that I have been there. But so, I think a historical novel is different too. Yeah. I think you could do it with a historical yeah. novel. Yeah, because oh, you're going to be able to find yeah. out. Your research is going to be yeah. very accurate. Yeah. You're going right. to be able to find out so much more. Um, right, which is why I said I wanted to know more about the right. plot. Like to yeah. hear more about and exactly. see how it tied in. Because it's puff, clearly it's possible, right? If you right. Did it well, yeah. so. right. Valerie, what do you say? Valerie, so, well, you, you know, know, I think it's... Go ahead. I think 
it depends on the genre. Certainly, if it's sci-fi or fantasy, it is going to be, um, you know, world building. That That's what do. I was just looking at. You actually sent me this question and I loved it. But yeah, so yeah. in that case, you really are, are world building. But so. Right, right. But so I think, um, you. <laughs> you know, like I've been to Paris once. Um, some of the scenes, you know, the places in Paris that I wrote about, like uh, the restaurant in the Eiffel Tower, well, you know, I was able to research that. And there really is that restaurant that I have the scene set in. So I was able to, you know, kind of describe it and talk about the menu and everything. And then in What's Not Lost, the apartment that uh, Cassie uh, lives in in Paris, I was able to find an apartment online in Paris and be able to you know, describe it. So, you know, I think, you know, someone said, you know, Google is our friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's you know. easier now that we have that tool yeah. because it's not like you're just inventing out of whole cloth or even just something Correct. that you're reading an encyclopedia, but you can, I mean, walk all of these places and pick up a lot of this, that been there since. So I think, uh, thank goodness, thank goodness for Google. <laughs> it is true. It's truly amazing. We, we, you know, we complain and we want to say, you know, all these things are not good, but they, they do have their, they do have their, their purposes. Um, buy a lot. I buy a lot less research books now. <laughs> right, right. Right. You don't need right. them. I mean, you right. can just, like you said, we can just walk down these streets and, yeah, and you can do it like on the spur of the moment. You're like, yes. uh, somebody said menu. He was like, I need to find out if they actually serve she uh -huh. crab soup. Look it up. Yep, on the menu, so you yes. get it. You can get it right, like in an instant. So it's having that at your fingertips, it, all those little details, just layer in a sense of reality. And I yes. think it's easier to to give that been there sense now. Yeah. More Even than ever. things like in my book, I talk about the Phillies, and you know, so I had to go back. Okay, this summer, that when was this series play? Who did they play in this month? Mm -hmm. And what was the score? Did they win? You know, because there's a scene where I kind of reference the. There's a game that's mentioned. It comes up later then that kind of triggers my character's memory. But you have to, you know, so, but, but you can do, oh, in a minute. No, wait a minute. I can find out, you know, what, what, what was the, who won that night? Who were they playing? What was the score? It's just amazing how you can find all these things mm -hmm. at your fingertips, which is great. It's very helpful. Uh, to. Not, I to did not the same play. thing with a, with a Red Sox game. Um, Patriots. Had to, <laughs> well, it was a Red Sox game <laughs> that I had I to do with the Patriots too. So. Oh yeah, that um, that it that it got rained out, so, and it really did get rained out. So, I was going to say, no. I was going to say that did they did they play the Phillies and the Phillies won? <laughs> no, they no. played Baltimore. You never mentioned that. <laughs> she well, writes, well, this, did, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this has been so fun. I feel like we could go on and on uh, for hours. Um, I want you guys to tell everyone where we can find you and find your books. Before we do that, I want to say to everyone out there, Bookish Road Trip has a reading challenge that is tons and tons of fun. Um, if you go to bookishroadtrip.com and look for reading challenge, our books, all of our books, it's a bingo kind of thing. Um, and all of our books fit into at least one, but some even more square. So if you read our books, buy our books and read them, then you can also enter into the reading challenge and possibly you know, win some fun prizes. So you want to check that out on bookishroadtrip.com. So where can we find, Leslie, let's start with you. You have, your book is coming out this summer. Um, I am so thrilled and honored uh, to be part of your team, one of your early readers. I, ad I adore your writing and I adore you. Can you tell us where we can find you and where people can buy your books? Sure. Um, this is my first book, After Happily Ever After, and it's available anywhere books are sold. My second book, The Stories We Cannot Tell, is uh, will be out July 11th. And you can find me on my website at lesliearasmussen.com. I'm on Instagram at Leslie R. Author. I'm on Facebook at Leslie A. Rasmussen Author. I am everywhere. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I just want to thank you, Lee, and thank Bookish Road Trip. This has been really fun. Thank you all, mm -hmm. all of you guys. We're so happy. So, Leslie, yeah. Leslie, can we pre-order your book yet? Uh, only the Kindle is up yet. The paperback should be up in the next week. Oh, good. Yes, it okay. is up. Good. Good. 
Valerie, where can we find you? You are everywhere. You are I everywhere. I am everywhere, everywhere. So um, pink, blue, and green is what you need to think of. What's not said is pink. What's not true is thicker and blue. <laughs> and what's not lost is green, um, which was my granddaughter's favorite color. So we went with that. Um, so all of the paperbacks are available wherever uh, you buy your books. And for what's not said and what's not true, you can get the ebooks everywhere. What's not lost um, the, uh, is available in ebook on Kindle right now and Kindle Unlimited. So that's if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can go in and get what's not lost very easily. Um, my website is, is on the screen, ValerieTaylorAuthor.com, and social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and um, Twitter. All right. Awesome. Please, Please come where follow you? me. Oh, oh, and I have a wonderful, wonderful newsletter. Yes, you do. You, you do. <laughs> that, <laughs> where I don't just talk about me, I'd like to offer something to readers. So my theme is that uh, for most of my new newsletters, I pick a country and do some research on some of the historical contributions of that country to literature. Oh, that's awesome. I do Ooh. love you also do on Facebook, you pick a year and it's like you do the, what was the top song, yeah. what was the top TV show. What, I'm, and I'm going to blame you for taking up time when I should be concentrating on doing other things. I'm, I'm trying to guess these things and I'm usually wrong, but then I have to go look them yeah, up. I know. So that's now so I fun. started year, year of songs this yes, year. Yes, so fun. Every week I put out a post of, about a year of songs. Yes, and we'll look for we'll look for a Billy Joel song to be the number one song of one of your years. Oh, I'll have to I'll have to do some research on that. You might have to. Yes, Suzanne, where can we find you? Same deal. Website. My first name, last name. It has all my buy links, uh, my social media links. Um, it has my book trailer up there. So you can learn a little bit more about me. But any information that I'm going to be putting out will be updated on the website. And it's and when when will your novella be? available to order October 10th 2023 okay. I'll be doing That's a cover reveal deal before that yeah okay yeah. awesome great and Barbara where can we find you um like Valerie my name is on the screen Barbara Davis dash author because if you don't put the dash author you get Betty Davis's sister who I am clearly <laughs> not or you get the the woman who writes true crime fiction and I get a lot of emails from very creepy people in jail that said, hey, can you write a book about my case? And I got one this morning, just this morning. And I'm like, I'm that girl. So Barbara Davis uh, dash author dot com. That's my, my website. Or you can find me at Barbara Davis author uh, on Facebook. My books are wherever books are sold. Easiest way still is to find them on Amazon. And then yeah. you can just click on my on my uh author page and, and see all of them. My next book, The Echo of Old Books, which is sort mm -hmm. of a literary romantic whodunit. It's two books inside another book. Um, comes out in four days and it is mm -hmm. uh, it comes out on the 28th and it's up for pre-order now. Nice. That's great. great. I know. I can't wait to read that. Congratulations. So, I, so same you. thing. Oh, go ahead. My website is on the screen as well, LeeBukowski.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm not quite as creative as, although I've been taking a little bit of lessons and trying to get a little bit better on social media. Um, but, um, you know, Lee Bukowski on Facebook, um, Lee Bukowski author on uh, Instagram. I think I'm also on Twitter. I, I, I always forget because I don't do a lot <laughs> on Twitter. But so my book, A Week of Warm Weather, um, I'm going to be having a little birthday tour for her in, in uh, June. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll check that out. And hopefully you'll check out all I've read. I can honestly say this time I have read books of everyone on this panel. They're all fabulous. I encourage you to check them out, check out their work. And um, this has been so Fun hometown, the hometown girls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank really you so agree. much, Lee. Thank, thank you, Lee. Thank you were a great host. Oh, yes. thank you so much. And panels. And panels. <laughs> That's right. I didn't even and get confused. I have, go, I have to go book shopping and I have to go sign up for Valerie's newsletter. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Great job. Thank you. Bye. Bye.